firstly, well, thank you very much for letting us touch with you. Um, it's an honour. Um, what's the situation at the moment with the Comedy Vehicle Programme? Uh, I don't know, actually, I've got a meet on Wednesday um, where they uh, say if they want to do it again or not. Um, when, it, when it went out in, f in February, March, sort of perception of it was that it had done really well, and I think it would, um, everyone seemed to think it would get picked up again, but then the head of BBC Two left, the head of Comedy left, and when I mean, my experience before, I mean, not for 10 years, but it's always been that when new people take over a channel, they want to put their own stamp on it and cut anything that's sort of inessential. Yeah. So, well, the old really guard know. go, yeah. they hired you, you're out too. I think so, yeah, but, I mean, but I've got a meeting on Wednesday, but the good thing about that is when I leave it, um, they're supposed to tell me in May, then they're supposed to tell me in June, then they're supposed to tell me in December, it's now January, but, on, but as long as I know by the end of this month if it's off, I can get mm -hmm. on with... Um, Getting another live show together or do some other work. But what I don't want to happen is what happened in 2005 when they they commissioned it in May 2005 and told me I was doing it in 2006, and then they didn't. Then they decided they didn't want to do it. So I kind of lost a year because mm. obviously with booking theatres or stuff, you have to be able to work ahead. You know. Do you feel frustrated about that situation? Um, not really. I mean, I, as long as I as long as I know by January by the next week. Then I won't lose any other work this year. Um, also, kind of on the one hand, you sort of think, well, it did really well. Loads of people liked it. You might as well recommission it. What a shame if it's just one person at the head of the channel that doesn't like it, because I know all the other people do. But then on the other hand, one of the good things about the BBC is that it's not beholden to advertisers, and that sometimes the whims of a person also mean that really that things you like get done. You know, so. As long as you don't ascribe a moral purpose to it, and you just think of it as like a weather system, or something that is unpredictable, um, then it doesn't really matter. As long as you just sort of view it as, as long as, as long as I can remember to view having done the telly at all as about as meaningful as winning a scratch card, you know, <laughs> then then it doesn't matter. But if you actually start to think in terms of deserving things from television, then it's a bit of a bizarre way to think. Was the, do you think that the, 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 the decisions that, uh, that are made about things like that are based um, uh, on ratings, presumably? And are, they, are ratings calculated in a sensible manner? Um, I don't know if ratings are calculated in a sensible manner. I suspect they probably aren't, because I think that the, people, the way people consume television now is quite is much more predictable than it was before, because it's stored and, what, you know, and watched in different ways. Also, I, I don't think they always base um, decisions on ratings. Bad ratings is a good reason to get rid of something they don't like or don't want to make anymore. But um, if there's something they want, I think they'll keep it on irrespective of ratings. Likewise, um, good ratings is not necessarily a reason they'll keep something on. Lee Mack's sitcom going out got really good ratings for a mainstream sitcom, but that was cancelled. We, we don't know why. It's recommissioned now after being cancelled, but I mean, there are so many reasons why TV gets made or not made, and they're all filtered through the whims of people. I remember I did a series in the 90s called This Morning with Richard Not Judy with Richard Herring on BBC Two, and the official reason for the cancellation of that was that it failed to perform well in the post-Simpson slot. Um, but but we, were, we were on at different times every week. I think we were only in the post-Simpson slot about four times after the out of the ten times it was supposed to have been broadcast, and one of the times it was supposed to be broadcast, it was just cancelled. And one of the other times it was supposed to be broadcast was on a Thursday night, out of nowhere. It was always on a Friday night. And I was looked in the paper, and I saw that it was on. And we hadn't done the edit, because it wasn't due till the next day. So we had to go and try and find a, a editing suite, because no one had even told us that they'd brought it forward today. So, you know, that was based on ratings, presumably, but I just think they didn't like it. so. That was the end of that, you know. I, re I read you saying in a, a stand-up blog interview right. that you and uh, Richard Herring had, had at some point um, offered to be the heads of comedy at BBC Two. Oh, I think Rich applied for it. Yeah, right. yeah. I think well, applied he did, applied for it. Yeah, we didn't offer to it. I think the right. job was going, and he applied for it. Yeah, right. yeah. If do you see do you foresee collaborations with Richard Herring again in the future? Um. Well, no, but but I would like to do the double act again. But I think I'd, I'd like to do the double act again 
either as a tour or a big one-off show or something or maybe a little drama like The Odd Couple or something but I think there's an optimum time to do it and I have a feeling that the longer you leave it the funnier and more strange it will be because our relationship, partly why I think it ran out of steam a bit towards its end was because we met when we were 18, 19 and so our relationship was based on the sort of bickering and one-upmanship and desperation and self-conscious cool of teenage boys and that wore a little thin as we moved into our early 30s but I think when if you're a pensioner that's how old people start to behave like that again and I think it would be really funny and there was a particular thing we always had in mind which was there was a, uh, a Scottish music hall act from I think probably from before the war called Francie and Josie and they're one of these classic musical acts, particularly classic for Scotland, where they were enormous in Glasgow, but not even popular in Edinburgh, like 40 miles away, back when there was incredible regional scenes. And in the 80s, they got back together for a series of shows at the Glasgow Empire, which was their stomping ground when they were young. They must have been like 90, I mean, they were really old, but they were still in the same relationship of the pesky one and the, and the smug one. And it was really great of old men, and it's a great video. We used to love it, and I sort of see it. I think, you know, it might it might be something um, way down the line. Of course, we'd be we'd be seventy, and all the people that used to like the show would be sixty by then. You know, so it would be. I think it would be something to do. The longer you can leave it, the funnier it would be. It's very hypothetical, and it's not something you'd necessarily be interested in. But if you were the head of comedy at a television channel, yeah, what would you do? What would be the first thing you'd change? Well, um, what would you change? I'll say, what would you commission? And what, what would I would commission, commission now? If I was commissioning stuff now, yeah. well, I'd probably, I'd probably scrap all the panel games, right? Except possibly QI, even though I don't really like that. But I think it's not. I don't think it degrades the human spirit, QI, <laughs> in the way that all the rest of them do. I'd, I'd try and um, let people play to their strengths. Like, instead of finding a really good stand-up and thinking, what can we fit them into? Will they work in a sitcom or whatever? I'd just let them do shows like um, like Mike Harding used to on BBC Two in the 70s or, or, or Dave Allen used to on BBC Two in the 70s. And I think there's all sorts of people like... Um, uh, say uh, Joe Caulfield who's sort of taken for granted normal middle-aged woman stand-up but if you suddenly put her on telly doing her stuff for half an hour in a sympathetic environment in the way they film me loads of people would go oh thank god I didn't know that was out there and um, I think there's all sorts of people that you could um, that you could do stuff with if you'd actually think about what suits them rather than trying to fit them into something else and actually there's a lot of good comics who do get on those panel games that aren't allowed to play to their strengths. So um, I'd do that. I wouldn't do something like put cowards on BBC Three for three episodes, and then and then or BBC Four, and then decide that that constituted a fair crack of the whip. I think having committed to something, you have to give it time to uh, to develop. Um, uh, but I mean, I think that you know controllers change every five years. They bring their own personal taste with them. I think. I think it could be a lot worse. I think. I think Channel Four programmes tend to be commissioned and made in a spirit of cynicism, where they have a rather contemptuous idea of who the public are and what they want. I think BBC Two programmes, at their worst, they're made in a spirit of sort of panic desperation. But I don't think their intent is to condescend, and I don't think they hate the public in the way that in the way that Channel Four appears to. So I kind of think. With the BBC, even though I've been really messed around by them over the years, and have had some of the most idiotic conversations with them, I think you know, on a global scale, only HBO's better, really. You know, it's more even though there's incompetence sort of rather than malice from the BBC. Yeah, incompetence rather than malice. Yeah, not not really malice, just sort of, just sort of the the impossible bureaucracy of it. But that's also. Why well, it's good? It's sort of there's a, there's a lots of checks and balances in that, and fiddle and fuss. And it's also it's the same kind of bureaucracy that sort of allowed John Peel to go on for decades without sort of being stopped as well. You know what I mean? There's there's pros and cons to it. You know, and there are some amazing things that were done. I mean, like 
you know, in 1979, when alternative comedy was new and everyone was really scared of it, Robin Nash, who was a sort of bow tie sporting, uh, Robin Nash, who was like a bow tie sporting old school light entertainment producer, sent the young uh, uh, Paul Jackson down to the comedy store to film all this stuff, which is the equivalent of sending a boat up the Amazon in, in Victorian England. You know, they do do some amazing things. Unfortunately, they have lost most of the <laughs> footage of those things, but they have, they have done it, you know. So much priceless material has yeah. been lost. Do you think with Channel 4, there's more a single overall authority whose law uh, I don't know, I don't know enough about it, you know. I mean, I've only, I've only done one piece of television in a decade, and... Um, you know, I know as mu about as much about it as anyone. But I mean, everyone's experiences, of they're, they're, they're all, everyone's got a funny story about it. I mean, I remember going through it, because I also write, because somebody at Channel 4 noticed that I did stand up and wrote for theatre, but also did music criticism for papers. Mm -hmm. And so I got asked to go and see someone in arts at Channel 4 to, to pitch something in about 2001, head of arts or whatever she was. And this is what you do. I said, one of the things I'd do right now, I would do a documentary about what they call the alternative country music. There's people no one appears to have heard of, like Calexico and the Jayhawks, who are selling out big venues like the Empire. Empire. Um, there's, there's all this like low-level buzz about it, and the Barbican have got a season coming up called Beyond Nashville, which will sort of consolidate it and lead to a load of broadsheet articles. So went, oh, I've not heard of that, we're not interested. A year later, I was asked him again, what would you pitch? And I pitched and I asked her, did you ever have a think about this beyond uh, this alternative country idea? And she said, well, we're completely on top of that, because I don't know if you know, but the Barbican are doing this beyond Nashville thing. And so the bullshit arts person has to pretend that they knew about it all along. And actually, your, your problem is being ahead of the curve. What you have to do for sort of arts commissioning is actually sort of arrive at the idea at about the same time as a desperate middle-aged person who's trying to appear cool would do. Whereas if you're actually ahead of the curve, you're, you're viewed as some kind of like eccentric loony, and then your idea is actually delivered to you, back to you 12 months later. The best one was Jane Root, who was the head of BBC Two, who once told me that I needed to go away and um, listen to a programme called On The Air and try and learn about how to write from that, which I know is one of the four, I was one of the four writers of it. And I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't even bring myself to bring that up in the meeting. She was in the process of turning something down that I was doing, and why couldn't it be more like this other thing, which was better? But I'd done that, so I, but, and I just didn't want to do that kind of thing anymore. You know, so it is weird. And presumably you know. there was some of your qualities in the yeah, programme yeah, you were pitching. Yeah, you know, there's well. all sorts of funny things like that. Mm. And, and I mean, Paul Putnam puts it really well. It's sort of like pitching things to TV controllers. It's like the only way you can understand it is in terms of like Franz Kafka or Lewis Carroll. And in fact, I wonder what we'd have done to understand the modern world of bureaucracy without Kafka. Because it's sort of, basically, you, you will give a, a, in something that fulfills the criteria they were asking for, but by the time it's gone in, like rather like the Cheshire Cat changing the answers to riddles, the criteria that were wanted will have changed. I mean, I, lo I, lo I remember one of the official reasons for a turn down of a, of a second series for a programme I directed for BBC Two called Attention Scum in the early part of the last decade was that it, it didn't fit the brief of the new BBC Two, which was now aimed at affluent, sophisticated, over 35-year-olds. I remember thinking that sentence was really funny, because first of all, it conflated a notion of affluence with sophistication, which I'm sure anyone who has a taste for nice films or books, but is a teacher, for example, <laughs> might just be baffled by. Uh, and also, uh, it was such, such so, I mean, who's that demographic? It was really, it was like, really I just thought, in, in five seconds, the notion of equating affluence with sophistication would fall apart. And, and you're the head of a channel, like, who are you, you know, so, but I think it's difficult for them because basically they want to follow their hearts, they want to turn down things they don't like on instinct, but they're obliged to make it sound as if that is the result of a logical process. Find the reasons, yeah, reason, tell you yeah, it came yeah. from the process or yeah. committee decision, not just, yeah. I'm sacking you. But let's not, you know, let's not, the lo loads of good things that we like, they're a result of similar whims, you know, that yeah. somebody, somebody sort of thinking, we should give those chaps a try, you know, whatever. I just had a question about yeah. your your comedy heroes, really. I mean, um, alternative comics of the past. Well, uh, when I was a kid, and I didn't realise it until I was an adult, and I think about it, I think Dave Allen really went in. I think it's, I think it really went in 
from television. I, uh, the, the person that made me want to do stand-up was seeing this guy called Ted Chippington, opening for The Four in 1984, who was the first of what a, a broadsheet journalist now would call anti-comedians, you know, a guy who had no personality, no act, no apparent reason for being on stage, but created this amazing buzz of confusion in the room. Um, so then, then in 1987 in Edinburgh, when I was a student, doing a student show, I saw a bill that was um, Jerry Sadovitz, Arnold Brown, who's a very slow, measured, old Glaswegian comic, um, more like Chick Murray or like, and, and um, or like variety circuit people almost. Arthur Smith, who you must know, who writes lots of really good plays, and, and, um, and Norman Lovett, who was the deadpan voice of the computer in the first series of Red Dwarf. And, and then, when the f then, and that bill, plus Ted Chippington, became the absolute, that was the recipe of what I did when I started doing stand-up. It was absolutely those people just copied to the point where a tape now of it would sound embarrassing. And then the first few months I was in London in 1989, I saw this Irish guy, Ted, uh, uh, Kevin McAleer, who again was slow, weird, focused in on particular things. And I think those sort of six people were absolutely, um, and Simon Munnery actually, who I saw about the same time doing this double act, God and Jesus, were, were really sealed it. But then also the other thing that's weird is that the people that you start out with, I mean, I was, I was lucky, I think, to have started out with Richard Herring and then Harry Hill. You know, sort of you get some influence from them together. You know, sort of, sort of, and and then and then in the last few years, uh, Johnny Vegas has been a big influence on me. Weirdly, although you wouldn't, you'd have to squint to realise it. But just in his confidence to go into a room and and not worry about whether it's getting laughs and to try and play the emotional truth of a thing. And hope that the, the comedy will then follow it. Um, so, and, and, and you know, that's it really. Ben Elton would have been achieving fame around the time that you were going off to. Yeah, he was. But seeing, but uh, when I saw Ben Elton on telly and people like that when I was 13, I, I liked it, but I could never have imagined doing it because it didn't seem like I liked it, but I couldn't imagine doing it because it was too fast and lively and confident and personable and. It looked like you'd have to be the life and soul of the party to want to be that person. And then seeing Ted Chippington, which was the opposite of that, sort of swept all of them away for me, really. Yeah. How long did it take you to find your voice? You, you, you had your influence um, by those people? Well, well, I think, not, not till about five years ago, really, and I think, um, I think, I think in everything I do in the, in, in the 90s, you can see all those people I've just mentioned, um, and, and, and I, but then I think 20 years later the influence of them is still there, but added to it is, and this again sounds really like granddaddish, but it's having had enough life experiences and things happen to you to be able to do something with all those influences, um, you know, rather than, and, and I've been really lucky, the last four basically. shows, you know, stuff, the, the last three stand-up shows, stuff has happened to me that's given me stuff to talk about. In 2005, being the centre of kind of censorship complaints thing, was not many people have that to talk about. 2007, being in this pile of comedians, I found really funny. And then, you know, currently trying to sort of work out wh where you fit in, you know. So basically, you finally got something to talk about added to all their influences, which makes you different to them. Do you, do you think that um, there are the right financial rewards for creative work? Do you think that people are rewarded properly? For well, um, work in I, think, I think it's, um, first of all, I think it's amazing that any artist is rewarded properly. Right? That's, the, that's the amazing thing. And when, when I get chippy about the things that I feel I haven't done as well as I should have done out, I remember that most of the people whose work I like, whether they're writers, musicians, comedians, or whatever, have died in poverty, right? So, I've got I've got a mortgage, right? I'm already ahead of um, of most people I like, but I, I think that I think that there is there's a, there is a weird thing though. Like for example, 
Okay, if, if Comedy Vehicle gets commissioned, I've been given a heads up that it will be on a reduced budget, which means my fee will be reduced by a third, because all, all budgets are coming down in light entertainment because of the shame of Jonathan Ross's salary, basically, as a sop to the, um, to the broadsheets. And um, Alan Carr, who's a, who's a comedian, has gone, we're happy about this, I'm happy to take a salary cut, because I'm, um, I think the BBC's great. But it's different for him, because Alan Carr, He's, he's not really a comedian anymore, he's more like a content provider and someone writes all the feed lines at the top of the show. And if he goes on telly for a reduced fee, it doesn't really matter. Because telly for him is about maintaining a position so that he can get corporate gigs and advert work and all those sort of things which will make him five times what he makes off telly. Now I, 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 I don't and can't do that kind of work because I don't write that kind of material, right? So I'm sort of doubly penalised whereby, for me, television is an end in itself of doing the work. It's not about trying to get corporate gigs or adverts or hosting jobs or acting work. So in some ways, you're, you are kind of penalised. But, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's still amazing at all to be, to be paid. And it's particularly amazing for me to be paid. Because... That's quite... Because, because what I do is, is, fa is fairly close to to fringe, mm. you know, and, and there are there are parts of it. It's almost anti-establishment. Right? Yeah, there are not that you know, and, and to be to be paid to be paid by the establishment to go on it and say it's rubbish <laughs> seems really bizarre. And I, you know, and that's another thing is like that's work if you can get it. You know, on the one hand you can go, oh, why won't they recommission it? I hope they do. It did do really well. But on the other hand, like it's kind of amazing. It's on at all. So you know, I'm. I'm sort of in two. I'm in two minds about it. I just, and I, I already feel like it would be churlish to. It would be churlish to go. Why am I not making as much as a comedian that does corporate gigs and 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 lots of stuff like that? Because actually, I'm making more than a jazz musician. You know what I mean? I'm making more than the best jazz musician in Britain. <laughs> You know what I mean, which is which isn't fair. It's playing at already, Scott, so, sort of you know. Are, are there models where work which is less commercial can be financially protected? Well, there there were uh, about five years ago, I started to figure this out because I was a co-writer of this thing, Jay Springer the Opera, that did that won won lots of awards and it went in the West End. But there were so many overheads, and there were so many conflicts of interest between the producers wanting to save money on the show, but who also represented us as clients and we didn't get paid a royalty that I sort of came out of this multi-million pound thing with I made about 20 grand a year out of it over five years but not but at, you know as someone I was, I was like down as a owning a third of it or something it wasn't the amount compared to what it took is really mad. And then and also in the 90s when comedy was called the new rock and roll what it mainly shared with rock and roll is that your management spent a lot of money on you you didn't see any of it so again, I was on telly on the mid-90s, but most of the money was lost on live tours that lost money. So when I went back to stand-up in 2004, I was thinking, look, I don't do corporate gigs, don't do adverts, I'm never going to be a household name. But lots of people I like in music manage to do this. How do they do it? And you look at it, and it's about not, not it's about coming around every year to your audience with a new piece of work, so they can come back in confident that it will have changed. It's about actually playing to your strengths of what they want rather than trying to diversify. Um, and it's um, and it's about uh, um, chopping away all extraneous overheads. Like, there's actually no point advertising in tabloids if you're probably only going to be broadsheet news re paper readers coming. You know, it's sort of all those things. And it was also no point playing, getting a big fee to play a publicly funded um, theatre in a city centre where a hundred people come to an empty 500 seater room. You should do the 100 seater comedy club for a quarter of the money because next time everyone comes back with a friend, you know, and it's sort of really strip it back and I think I learned that from looking at musicians that I like that are still going after 30 years like The Fall or Giant Sand or lots of the folk musicians and lots of the jazz musicians. Well it's sort of doable you've got to be realistic about it. And I remember, and I said to John Hegley, the, the poet, you know, I said to him about five years ago, how'd you keep going? 
and he said, "There's five. You know, if if you go back to the same five thousand people every year with a new thing, like five thousand people all giving you ten pounds a year, that's an amazing living, you know." And and then with the tour for this, for example, you don't see me having advertising on the on the on the back of newspapers. I've done it all through MySpace and things like that. Mainly, there's some, but not very much. Which probably means when you look at a tour poster for for Russell Howard and he's doing arenas, I'm probably seeing more of the money because that's that's got television advertising. So, but he's tied in. He's managed by a production company who would love to get him another TV commission because they'd make the program and they'd get the money for it. So they're spending the money on promoting him for that. But I'm a free agent now, so it's sort of it is it is simpler. And what I'd say to any artist or musician or one is actually. If five thousand people like you and they all give you ten pounds a year, you're you're ahead, right? And that seems really simple. But if you say, but you need fifty thousand people to like you if you've got a huge, um, you know, flotilla of overheads and people around you, that, you know, um, you can you can you can cut away <coughs> loads of stuff as long as you don't want to be famous. If you want to be famous, you've got to spend a lot of money. But if you just want to be a working artist, you might be all right. You know, hey, you've sold out here every day. Of the yeah, week. yeah. So it's been, and I mean, they, they, it's been, it's been really well done. And I was in the Soho Theatre brochure again. They were, they did a cross promotion, but then that hits the people that might like to come. You know, it's sort of, there does come a point when it's not, it's sort of, I don't, I'm not really interested in, I'm not really interested in having a larger audience of people that would like the show less, so it won't go as well. <laughs> You don't want to compromise the show. It's not even compromise. Compromise has got that's a term that has an ethical dimension. Mm. It's not even as big as that. It's just you can't be asked with the ass <laughs> of it. Just the, you, you talk of the internet. You talk of using MySpace yeah. as a marketing yeah, tool. Yeah, yeah. The internet also has another aspect in that people can put content up there and download it for yeah. free. Well, has that affected your earnings? Well, first of all, there's two, there two ways of looking at that. Are when. There were loads of clips of things that I'd done on telly put up on the internet. And when I started doing stand-up again in 2004, I was, it was immediately apparent to me, talking to people after gigs, that people that had never heard of me in the 90s were coming because they had seen stuff on YouTube, right? And it, and it made the difference between playing from up to 100 people to doing 150 people, in, I think, you know, in, in various places, and it built from that. The, uh, the flip side of it is that is again, it's all about the ugliness of economics, and it's difficult now to talk about the development of any form of art without talking about the delivery mechanism and the economics behind it. Like the rise of iPods and MP3s has changed the kind of music that's produced, what it sounds like, and how it's sold and consumed. Right now, w with comedy, if you're if you're um, if you're Michael McIntyre, say, you can afford to give a quarter of a million of your DVDs to HMV at three pounds each. That's what they pay you for them, to stop them. But for that many and at that price, they'll put them all up the front and they'll put you in their chart and then you probably make a load of money out of it, even at three quid a unit. I can't afford to do that because I don't sell enough. So that's why you don't really see much of my stuff in shops. You're basically being asked to give it away. But on the internet, I can, I can sell things for ten pounds that I've spent two grand filming and it sort of is I, I, I make more out of selling something that I shot for two grand on the internet um, than, I, than I do out of selling something I shot for twenty thousand pounds to shops right uh, basically I make about thirty thousand out of either of them but but the internet one is um, with much lower overheads the, the the bad thing about that is that um, everything I've done is um, is all up on torrent sites. And the, the commercially released shop DVD that I just did last year, 41st best standard ever, is downloaded illegally ten times more than it's sold. And the problem with that is there's no incentive for the people that put up the money to put up the money for it, and that means that the next one doesn't get filmed. So it won't even be there to download illegally. How much do you think those ten times sales are lost? How many of those are lost sales? Do you think? Oh, they're all lost sales, I think. Oh, yeah, sorry. I think they're all lost sales. Yeah, and I, I sort of. So that's the problem. I doesn't. I don't really. 
I don't. At the moment, I don't know what I think of it, but it will be a problem if it means that you can't actually afford to produce the content anymore because you've lost so much of it free. Thank That's you. the only thing. And also, a Michael McIntyre can absorb that, right? But I can't. Plus, actually, I suspect that my audience are the sort of people that illegally download things a lot more than a Michael McIntyre audience because they're probably all like. They're a bit cleverer, you know, so they'll know how to yeah. how to do it. And I don't mean that in a. That's not a criticism of him. Yeah. It's just like there's loads of old ladies are buying Michael McIntyre DVDs, so they're not like they're not on the internet working out how to steal stuff off a torrent site. It's probably technically might, complicated. Yes, to, you will to do that. I don't know how to do it. For example, I couldn't do it. So you know, um, so that that's interesting. And uh, you know, Richard Herring's done an interesting thing lately, which is. Having had his radio series cancelled by the BBC, he worked out he could get he could get more money and budget for it by just charging people to come in here to this theatre and watch him recording a script. Not hugely well, technically, he'll admit, but then he just chucked it out on the internet free. And that is an amazing thing that that, that is that that's more. And I, and I did I did a play, a one man play for a month at the Bush Theatre in London about three years ago. Called what would Judas do? And there was loads of umming and ahhing from BBC Drama about whether they wanted to broadcast it. And in the end, I looked at what the fee would be for Radio 4 while they fed me into their nine month waiting system. And I worked out that if I recorded it and sold it on the internet for, for 10 quid and did 200 copies, I'd already made more from selling it to 200 people than I would for it being broadcast. So, there's a, on the, although it's bad that everyone's stealing our stuff, on the other hand, the sort of direct marketing of the internet suddenly renders quite high-profile gigs largely irrelevant. You were talking about the, the, the Judas show, and earlier you talked about Jerry Springer, the opera. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you think the, the period that some people call the war on terror period has affected freedom of speech, the religious fundamentalisms and so forth? I think it's a bit early to say. I think that... Um, I think that the, I think that um, the the problem with um, with doing stuff about Islam is we don't know we don't know enough about it culturally to to make as sophisticated or subtle jokes about it as we do about um, Christianity, right? And and newspaper columnists would say you're just cowardly and you don't want to be killed. There's an element of that, but I also think you've got to sort of get it right. I think a watershed moment might be the release of um, of uh, Chris Morris's film about Islamic terrorists in the UK. Is he did three years research on that, and he went and met all the people, and I think he tried to get under the skin of of um, of uh, Muslim Britain, and, and 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 hopefully, if he's done if he's done it with the with the thoroughness of everything else he's done, then hopefully. We, we might we might be about to, to pass that point because bizarrely in my experience people don't necessarily mind being made fun of what they don't like is being made fun of in a stereotypical inaccurate badly thought out lazy way like and it, but it, it, but it may be naive to say that the sort of people that that have elements of their culture that feel that religious violence is justified will feel like that. But I think it could be quite an it could be quite an interesting year to see what happens there. When you went to St Edmund Hall, Oxford, yeah. and you studied English. Yeah. You received a full grant. That was eighty six to eighty nine. Yeah. Well, it was a long time ago. Yeah. 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 Now, how do you think the current levels of student debt will affect the careers of potential comedians? I think, it affects, I think that um, I think that the withdrawal of the grant and the um, implication of um, of uh, of student loans necessarily limits people that want vocational careers and produces a generation of people who feel that the only purpose of education is to earn money, and you already see it happening, right? It's, it's changed the the vibe of a campus and it changes the kind of people that want to go to college and I think it was done deliberately. I think it was done deliberately to to rid us of all these troublesome thinkers and artists, right? 
and of conscientious people. And I think that I think that if Thatcher could have done it, she would have done. And I, because I remember a really famous bit of television. Well, I don't think it was famous, but it was famous to me, where she was going. It was in about 1988, and she was being shown round a, a women's college in Oxford, and she said to this girl, "What are you studying?" And it was just broadcasters, just a bit of like filler footage. But Thatcher went, what are you studying? And the girl said, ancient Norse literature. And Mrs Thatcher went, oh, what a luxury. And this wasn't pointed up as meaning anything, right? But it does mean something. What it means is that the Prime Minister attached no intrinsic value to knowledge of another culture or of the past or of its language. And it's a cliche to say, but you understand the modern world through, the, uh, through, through its echoes in the past. And obviously, there's not a huge financial future in um, studying ancient Norse literature, but but um, but we do need people to know about these things. And the trickle down system, the trickle down effect of their knowledge enriches a culture and the people in it. And to say that, what she said, what a luxury, indicates that if it wasn't, an, uh, if she didn't believe there was a direct financial value to it, that it was of no value, and the pursuit of that information should not be subsidised by the state. And that's wrong. And I think it was done deliberately. It's wrong commercially, though, isn't it? Because if you look at Lord of the Rings, those films wouldn't exist well, without Tolkien. Yeah, that made a lot of money, didn't they? But, the, but you know what? The problem with that is then you start, you're being drawn into fighting the war on their terms. When Batsy Arts Centre was threatened with closure because of its withdrawal of uh, funding from Wandsworth City Council and when, Wandsworth uh, Council, and when um, the Bush Theatre was threatened with closure because of the withdrawal of its grant from the Arts Council, the um, bigwigs from both those places engaged with their detractors by saying, but look, we developed Jerry Springer the Opera and that went on to the West End and made loads of money for businesses. And the Bush went, we developed this play about what's it and so-and-so was in it and this went wherever. But actually, that, what they should have said was, look, we put on for a week a bloke um, blowing into a balloon and dragging it around on the floor and making funny sounds. And that didn't transfer to the West End because it has no commercial future, but it is inherently worthwhile. That's what they should have said and that's why it needs funding. But instead, they, they engage on their terms, and they've already lost because they talk to these people uh, as if the only point of the art were to make money for shops in the West End because people on the way to the theatre were buying crisps. You know, it's sort of, it's really, um, it's like you've already lost because instead of going, well, we feel this has an inherent value in of itself, you've gone, yes, but it, look, it, look, it made loads of money. You know, so it's sort of, um, that is, it is a problem like that, you know. Broadly, then, yeah. with all of those themes about finance, and creativity, yeah. and commercialisation, do you feel positive about the next decade? Negative? Something in the middle? Uh, well, uh, you know, um, well, positive, I think, and probably more positive than 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, you could look at the lay of the land and you could say, at the risk of it being another cliche, that things were being dumbed down and that actually the, the multi channel environment meant that everyone was pursuing the same market rather than a diversity of markets so actually the variety of voices heard and opinions expressed and styles of art broadcast was diminished and that would have been true and that is continuing to happen but actually there's this thing like when, when you um, when you press down on air in a plastic bag it sort of pops up somewhere else and for all the faults people are saying about the internet and it's 99% pornography and they're stealing all our work um, just having access to people via MySpace, and I only use MySpace really, but I could use the other ones, but just doing that meant that I was able to tour cost effectively by, by mail shotting 8,000 people directly, um, which I'd never been able to do before, and, and, and it, it gave me a, a lease of life artistically, which I would have needed to be broadcast somewhere or put on the front of a magazine to have got in any other way. So I think um, even as mainstream media just falls in on itself, something else will, will pop up. And I know, like, the, I'm a real latecomer to it, and I feel a bit like, um, I remember my granddad watching t a television in 1982, and an advert came on for Kentucky Fried Chicken, and he said to me, do you know, in America, they have for shops and they only sell Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> and obviously, he hadn't really understood that that was what that was, that there are, there had been for, that's what they are, took a virtual job. So when I say to people on the internet, I think this, the internet, might really catch on. I'm aware that it does sound a bit like an old man saying, apparently you can show films on it and stuff. It, like, it's like a television.
it's going to be great. But um, but I just it, it only gradually dawn, dawns on me sort of every day a little bit more that just what it might mean. And um, and I don't, for me, I don't see it as an end in itself. I don't see it as like I wouldn't put con much content. I wouldn't try and develop content for the internet. You can't really police it. But you can but to put some stuff out there to let the people in their bedrooms know that they could come out and meet some other people and see you doing something. I think that's, uh, it's, it's really, it's absolutely changed my life. It's changed the people that come see me. And it's, and it's also, the knock-on effect of that is it's given me a degree of financial security and, 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 the, and, the, and the knowledge that all I need to do to let 8,000 people know that I'm doing something is click a button and at least some of them will come you know on the on the celebrity culture front um, said a few things about Top Gear and I'm not sure if they're related yeah. but my question is really do you think the coming decade has the solution to this current celebrity culture do you think that's caused by the internet do you think do you think it's going to go away do you think the next thing will be something else I don't know I mean it I, 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 most things having got worse don't get better but in publishing the celebrity hardbacks aren't selling anymore but that may be which people optimistically say means people have realised that it's better to read a book by a writer than a book by someone that hasn't really got anything to say but is famous but it may but you'd have to compare that to declining book sales generally it may just be even worse news which means people just aren't even reading Jordan's books anymore <laughs> you know so they don't really know and um, you know you can it's really hard to predict these things you can never tell you know like like I was thinking today about Live at the Apollo on television there's people I like on that there's people I don't like on it but mainly even in 2000 even five years ago who would have thought that comedians who historically, stylistically, and sort of in terms of the, the sort of DNA of their of their history, that, that they have they do have some connection to alternative comedy, 1979, Year Zero. They're part of that continuum, and they're on BBC One, and millions of people are watching it, and that one and a half million people bought. Um, Michael McIntyre's DVD, which means one in, in, in 2010, one and a half million people like stand-up, which is, even if you think it's middle of the road, what he does is still closer to alternative comedy than it is to Joe Pasquale or, 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 um, or, or all the, all the stand-ups that were BBC, that were light entertainment staples when we grew up. And um, that, you couldn't have seen that three years ago, I think, you know. So some things change, but you, you couldn't predict how, what people will go for. Has the entertainment marketplace become more polarised with more availability? Uh, well, it, it has for me. I mean, I mean, because people can find out about me through different channels, um, Although I'm not the sort of person that can do chat shows or panel shows or be personable or be like a, a clubbable player, that it almost makes economic sense to be that because um, it means if if you're not of that, then all the people that don't like that will come to will come will come to you for something different. Whereas before, it meant you were you were. There's less noise to the point of it not being viable. Now it actually is almost like a, a a career decision. And the worst thing to do would be to go halfway to meet all that, mess it up, lose all those people, and not get them either. But there's something we said, and I think maybe all the culty bands of the 70s and 80s must look at how their their peers now, their followers now, can can cultivate an, an audience through tracks on MySpace and things like that, and must think, well, if only we had that means of communication, you know. I think to some extent, those old culty bands are being consumed now more than they were well, back yeah, then by a new audience. Yeah, because people, because it's easier to find. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think there's less need for, say, a stand-up to sell out to the corporate tastes and to do dinners at uh, institutes and just yeah. tell jokes about accountants and lawyers? Well, we don't. Yeah, well, there is less need. There's, you know, there's because you can be yourself. Yeah, and I mean, I really noticed that. 
Well, I stopped sort of doing the circuit in about 2001, 2000, and I started again in about 2004. And one of the reasons I stopped was when I'd be sent to clubs around the country, that they were all becoming increasingly sort of mainstreamy and like jongleurs. And there's lots to be said for those, but it just didn't work for me. I couldn't play those audiences, I couldn't give them what they wanted. But then when I started again in 2004, you know, Josie Long was running a night where everyone just read stuff off crumpled up bits of paper and Robin Ince had started Book Club. And in lots of provincial towns there were these clubs that were the alternative to the genre. So in the first half of this last decade, a sort of, because stand-up comedy had, in, had got into the mainstream and got so far away from what lots of people wanted, these other places had to kind of set up in opposition and they suddenly had their own audience, you know, so it does, um, it does keep changing, so I think there's every reason to be, to be optimistic. Where do you plan to go in literary terms? Uh, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a, well I wrote a sort of pulpy novel about ten years ago, I'm, and I'm doing a book at the moment for Faber and Faber, which is really great. Basically, when you get, whenever you get on telly, in the current climate, all sorts of divs from, from publishing companies come and ask you to do really terrible books, right? I got offered a book about funny cars because my TV series was called um, Stuart Lee's Comedy Vehicle and they hadn't seen it, but they'd seen that it was listed in a newspaper and obviously they think there's some tie-in, right? Um, but, then, but then this lovely offer came up that somebody at Faber wanted to meet me. Apparently everyone in Faber was watching the programme. So, and, and Faber put, the only other, Faber put out a book in the 80s which I had as a teenager of transcripts of Eric Bogosian's acts and Eric Bogosian was like a stand-up stroke performance artist from New York in the 80s. It being the 80s you couldn't see him anywhere, you couldn't buy the DVDs, you couldn't watch it on YouTube, but you could read this book and it was very inspiring to me as a kid. And so I thought I'd do a similar thing, I'm basically giving them transcripts of the last three stand-up shows, but each one's got twice the amount of wordage of like often quite spurious footnotes about where I got the ideas from or performance notes and then there's chapters in between them about what inspired the shows which actually covers quite an interesting period which is the period from having given up stand-up to starting it again off the back of Joe Spring of the Opera to the prosecution for blasphemy uh, to, um, to being given a TV series in 2005 it being taken away in 2006 it being given the pilot in 2007 and it finally being commissioned in 2008. So there's, so I think for Faber, it's going to be the most lowbrow um, book they've ever done. But in terms of a stand-up comedy cashing book, it's going to be the absolute Rolls Royce. Of, um, it's the most highbrow comedy book ever done. What well, simultaneously is the shoddiest thing in Faber's catalogue. So that's the thing in the, in the short term when doing that. Do you find yourself when you criticise certain individuals? maybe they're part of a commercialised or celebrity culture, do you find yourself sometimes thinking maybe I shouldn't criticise or satirise these particular individuals or do you think it's a, an absolutely important... Well, um, I'm, I'm, you don't, I'm, I don't really go on chat shows or, or I'm not at, at things, so I don't ever run the risk of meeting them. It would be more difficult to do that if I was um, more of a personality, and, but I'm not. So, um, But also most of them, I've thought about this a lot, that most of them, the things they've know or have said about themselves, you know. So I don't, I don't think you'd have a problem with it. And, uh, and they tend not to be about physical appearance or their sex lives. They tend to be some aspect of them that they've chosen to put across, which doesn't tend to square up with something I like. So I don't think, I don't think um, there's anyone I've done anything about that I'd be particularly embarrassed to me. Uh, there is something I do sometimes do though, is I'll, it amuses me sometimes to, to pick on someone utterly innocuous really quickly for no reason. Like I remember doing some line about Ian Hislop, right, and it just seemed to me like it was really funny because he's not someone that anyone would really take against for anything. <laughs> so that, got, perversely, that seemed really funny because, precisely because he's so benign harmless and largely a positive force in the world, you know, so things do sort of pop up, but, but um, m most of the things, you know, that people get would understand it, I think. If you were a vegetable, what would you be and why? 
Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, a, a potato, I, quite, I really like potatoes, and during a period of, Ill, of illness, of diverticulitis, I was told, I was recommended to eat a baked potato every day for the foreseeable future, and it was when I was on tour, and I became sort of obsessed with finding um, baked potato vans in different provincial towns, to the point where I became something of a connoisseur of them. And I actually, when, I, when, the, when the publishing companies came knocking and said, do you want to do a stupid cash-in book, I said to one of them, well, I wouldn't mind doing a book where I go around the country and review all the potato vans <laughs> in different towns, because actually they do tell you quite a lot about the town. Like the one in Worcester is very interesting, like who's in the queue. Because in Worcester, it's like Worcester woman, middle class affluent people, having a sort of dirty potato. It's kind of like a sort of, it's a sort of treat for them um, to go and have this, this um, sort of takeaway food. Whereas in, you know, Burnley or somewhere, it's just lunch. You know what I mean? And so that the, the actual um, there was something in it, but uh, that was turned down because the same publisher had already published Stuart McConey's Pies and Prejudice, and they felt they couldn't have two food-based comedy titles on the catalogue in the same year. That's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> that is speechless. <laughs> <laughs>